This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Hello again from Tel Aviv. This is Ido Aharoni, your host, and I'm very, very happy to have with us today Professor Erez Shmueli. Welcome Hi. to our show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And let me just uh, make sure that I'm not making any mistake because your title is very, very impressive. <laughs> Professor Erez Shmueli is a senior faculty member and the head of the Big Data Lab at the Department of Industrial Engineering, and he's also... the co-head of the undergraduate program in data science at Tel Aviv University. So we're here to talk about your academic work, talk about your future plans. But uh, as we do with all of our guests, we'd like to begin with the early days. So I know that you were born in Beersheba. That's right. And that you're very proud of it. Uh, indeed. I really like Beersheba as a city. So tell us about your childhood, your upbringing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as you mentioned, uh, I grew up in Beersheba. Uh, I spent there uh, probably half or a bit more of my life. Um, I, I studied in high school in Beersheba. Uh, actually, I met my wife in high school in Beersheba. Uh, later on during high school... And I should mention that she's also an academic at the Bar Ilan University. Right. Uh, Leora, my wife, is a very successful uh, researcher at Bar Ilan University, the Department of uh, Management, and also doing uh, research in the field of uh, healthcare, which is a bit uh, related to the things I'm doing right now. And by the way, growing up in Beersheba, a lot of our viewers and listeners don't know, but Beersheba is a desert community. <laughs> so would you have, do you have memories of, of growing up in a desert community? I have to say I didn't give it any, any special thoughts. So we grew up in our neighborhood playing, you know, outside like... Like Or, any normal town. Like any normal town back then, today children uh, go out much less. Uh, I hanged out with my friends. Uh, I don't remember anything special about the desert. Maybe the only thing that was missing was the beach or the sea, uh, which we went from time to time. But Beersheba is also known, obviously, for its uh, great history. Uh, Beersheba is uh, mentioned, of course, in the Bible. And, um, and then you have a more contemporary piece of history with World War I, with the British Mandate, the beginning of the British Mandate, and so on. And, uh, and also, Beersheba is known for sports. Right. I'm a big fan of Apoel Beersheba. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the last few years were not that good, but uh, hopefully we will get the championship uh, again soon. Yes. Uh, I mean, you, you had two... major historic runs one in the 1970s and one a few years ago and I think um, all in all it's one of the most uh, famous clubs and most successful clubs in Israel I agree and it has a, it has a soul like uh, unlike many other uh, I would say uh, uh, teams uh, Be Sheva has a great soul in it now when did you know that you're drawn to science oh that's a good question um you I would say, I wouldn't say science at first. I would say computers. I really liked computers since I was a very young child. What was your first computer? My first computer was a computer of my brother, which is older than me in 16 years, I would say. And I followed him in many things. The first computer was a Mac, a, Mac. a Macintosh back then. Uh, then we had... Uh, so this is early 1990s, I'm assuming. No, I, I think, actually, I'm not sure. It's, a, it's even a Mac. I think it's an Apple. It's, a, it's some, somewhere around the 80s, uh, when I was very, uh, very small. Um, followed then by a, a PC or a, <laughs> a, an imitation of a PC uh, later on. Um, I remember that... Uh, in one of my early birthdays, I asked my parents to buy me a memory stick for the computer. Not a stick, a memory card. And it was so expensive back then. We were talking about maybe one megabyte of memory, which today is clearly nothing. And that was a, 
an awesome upgrade to the computer. So it was very... <laughs> so your fascination with, uh, with information, with data, started with your early computers in the 1980s and then the 1990s. And how did that evolve into a career in, in data science? So um, it wasn't a direct uh, career path, I would say. It happened by uh, incident, I would say. Uh, I started my academic career uh, studying in the Open University computer science uh, in parallel to high school. So when I finished high school, uh, I also had the first uh, an undergrad uh, degree. So you're one of those geniuses. <laughs> you, may, you may say that, yeah. Uh, and then when I uh, joined the Army, uh, I joined the computer uh, software uh, unit uh, of the Air Force. Um, and then I was uh, doing computer stuff in that uh, unit. And during that time, I, I, I got to the conclusion that I'm a bit bored and I want to uh, broaden my, uh, my knowledge. And I started a second degree, uh, a, gra a graduate degree in uh, information system engineering. I would say that was the first time that the emphasis was more about information rather than programming, I would say. Uh, and I studied in Ben Gurion University. Uh, and then when I uh, left the army, uh, when I retired, I would say, um, I, I didn't want to continue to study. Uh, I actually pursued some path of uh, uh, incorporating a startup and commercializing some of the, the things I was uh, investigating during my master's. Uh, but my advisor back then, uh, Professor Yuval Alovich from Ben Gurion University, told me at that point, uh, you're going to study for PhD anyhow, so go ahead and register. But uh, I, I, I said, I don't want to do any PhD. I just want to fly to South America and travel and doing things like that. But I registered anyhow. Um, and that led me to, when I came back from uh, my uh, travel, I did start my uh, PhD. And it was awesome. Uh, it was very interesting. And what was this, the subject of your PhD? So interestingly, bo both the master's and the PhD dealt with information, but from another aspect of trying to protect the information. So what you can call today uh, cybersecurity or privacy, uh, so the first part dealt with uh, encrypt encryption. Uh, how, uh, what's the best way to encrypt a database, uh, uh, a storage of data that uh, can be accessed very, uh, very rapidly, but at the same time in a protected uh, manner. Uh, but also how to uh, anonymize data so that we can share data with other entities uh, without revealing too, too many uh, personal details. And then, and then you moved, uh, and I, I wanted to ask you a question about that, protecting information, because I know that you're in a different place today where you actually, you're, you see your job as extracting right. uh, information and value out of, of the data. But um, for the benefit of our listeners and our viewers, who are not proficient in this language. We all hear about blockchain, and people tell us blockchain technology could become the ultimate answer to the question of how do I protect information. If you can tell us what's your opinion about it and if you can also shed some more light on what is it exactly. Because it's a buzzword. We're, I'm not sure most people understand what it is. Yeah, uh, without getting into too many details, uh, one of the, the things that are more uh, most interesting about blockchain is that it's an infrastructure where everything that is made or everything that happens over that platform or framework is publicly available and signed in a certain manner. So everything you do is written, is audited, and it's impossible to change it later. Uh, so one of the promising uh, directions that we have now uh, in blockchain is how do you do that? How do you use that auditing technique but do it in a private manner, still protecting the data, because I just said that everything is public. So how can you uh, make the data non-public, but visible only to the participants that uh, need to see it? 
Uh, so there are a few companies, a few academic works about how to do it right now. And I, I, I assume that in the following few years, we will see how it actually uh, goes into practice. Got it. And, and um, when I'm assuming that there's also an element of breaking down the process, the interaction into units, each is encrypted in a different way, that way you increase the probability of protecting the information, if I, if I understand correctly. Yes, that's true. And, and by, by the way, that's one of the things, going back to my master's uh, uh, thesis, uh, that was one of the main uh, ideas there. So back then, uh, if you wanted to encrypt the database, what you would do is you would encrypt the entire file system, assuming a database composed of many different data points or data uh, parts, uh, and all of them are stored on the same, uh, let's say even the hard disk, like the one we know from our personal computer. So you can encrypt the entire hard disk, but if you do it, you cannot separate between different people. Any person that needs to access a, a, even a small piece of that data needs to have the key, the encryption key, to decode the entire disk, and then he has access to everything. Uh, so one of the main ideas we, we talked about then is how do you encrypt smaller pieces of the data so that different people or different roles can have different access. You don't have to give them the entire key to everything. So the same idea goes now to the blockchain uh, uh, part. So in, ma in many ways, your master's thesis kind of predicted the 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 whole discussion that we call today blockchain. In you 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 may say that I wouldn't say predict, but gave some uh, maybe some aspect that can be used in that uh, newer process. So from that you move to the other side of handling information, which is trying to get some knowledge, extract knowledge and value out of that information. That's true. So, so tell us about that transition. Why did you make that transition? So uh, after my PhD, I found a very nice position at MIT, at the Media Lab, uh, with Professor Sandy Pentland. And the original goal was for me to go there and uh, sh uh, use or utilize my uh, knowledge in uh, information security and privacy. And, and indeed, if I can say just a few sentences, we did use it. We we kind of, uh, I would say, invented or suggested or, in, or uh, proposed a new uh, way of protecting data when you want to share it. I will go very soon to the other aspect, but just to finalize this uh, part. And what we did is we suggested something that is called a, a personal data stores. So consider the idea of, uh, we all know Spotify, for example. So when we install Spotify on our smartphone, let's say, uh, Spotify needs quite a lot of information about us in order to uh, pers uh, give us personalized uh, playlists to adjust the, play song, the, the songs to, our, uh, uh, to us. And it can access quite a lot of information. Uh, but theoretically, it can access even much more. It can access, uh, it can even try to infer our mood in order to provide us the, the exact song. It can actually infer our activity level, whether we are running or not, and give us different songs and so on. And in order to do that, we need to give quite a lot of information uh, to Spotify, uh, which may be all right or not, depending on, our, uh, on what we want to achieve. But what we did then, we suggested instead of all of us giving the data to Spotify, we can do something different. Because instead of a, moving the data to the algorithm to Spotify, we can bring the algorithm to the data and analyze everything, let's say, hypothetically, on our smartphone. Spotify can analyze the things on our smartphone, make a decision. And the only thing that will go outside back to Spotify is what is the next song to be played. Okay, so wrapping up this uh, part, so yeah, so I started by uh, extending or uh, moving to other directions uh, in uh, privacy and uh, information security. Uh, but uh, the main thing that that group, the group at MIT was doing was totally different. It was how to use data in order to better understand human behavior. 
And I got very excited from that domain. Uh, and I started to, to join different studies and investigate those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, parts myself. And uh, in some way, that's the main thing I'm doing in, for, since then till today. So how data can be used, data that is collected mostly from our real life, from cell phones, from smartwatches right now, and from other devices. Uh, how we can use this data to uh, better understand human behavior, build computational model. The, the emphasis here is on computational, whether it's AI, uh, machine learning, network analysis, or other tools, uh, to describe better those behaviors, and later on be able to uh, predict this behavior, and in, in some cases even to change it. For the better, of course. So, and, and you had an opportunity during COVID when you had billions of people at home, um, isolated to a large degree, and increasing, really, their connectivity uh, to the point that, you know, was described by people as hyper-connectivity, right? We were, we were online 20 hours a day on average, and that gave you a lot of... Um, an abundance of opportunities to study human behavior. And I think that you were engaged in a very interesting study that involved monitoring um, the activity through a bracelet. Uh, so tell us about that study. Yeah, so uh, in an interesting way, just before COVID, uh, together with a, a good friend of mine, Professor Daniel Min from the same department, a good friend and colleague, uh, we submitted a research proposal for funding that talked about how we can use uh, or integrate big data sources uh, to better uh, diagnose and to have a earlier detection of a, a, a person being infected with, an infection, with a respiratory uh, infectious disease. So back then, uh, we talked about a, a flu, and perhaps a, a, a streptococcus. Uh, but later on, when COVID came, it was clear that the focus should be COVID. And what we did in this study, uh, when we started it, we actually uh, recruited five, more than 5,000 participants, uh, which we equipped with a dedicated mobile application that we developed. And we equipped everyone with a smartwatch, or I would say a smart band of a Garmin, a very nice one, a very small one, and a very comfortable one. And we monitored those people uh, for a period of over two years. Actually, some of the people are still participating in the study that uh, didn't end yet. And uh, in the mobile application, we asked the, the participants uh, many questions like, how do you feel? What is your stress level? How good you slept at night? And clearly, uh, much more symptoms that are related to, uh, you know, clinical symptoms related to respiratory diseases, like uh, did you have a fever? Uh, did you have chills? And many other questions. And, and those questionnaires were filled by those participants on a roughly on a daily uh, manner. Uh, so just consider yourself uh, participating in such a study where you have to fill a questionnaire every day. You have to wear your watch constantly. And if you don't do it, uh, you start getting notifications and messages and phone calls from a dedicated survey company that we recruited for that. Uh, that may be, that's the, uh, the side that uh, forces people to do it. But on the other side, we also uh, gave those people a lot of uh, engaging information, like how the data they provide help science, help make uh, medicine better, help make uh, uh, our studies, our science uh, much so, more. So, for example, in this study, what, what have we learned? Okay, so, so as I said, the original goal was to build models that allow us to predict uh, information being infected with an infectious disease like COVID. And, uh, because what, what your study did, basically, you were able to identify the level of susceptibility. So you said if this person with that kind of level of stress and so on, they're more vulnerable. Uh, 
to get uh, such a disease? That, 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 that's, the... that's a good uh, question because there are several levels. You can talk about susceptibility. So a person uh, slept less, his immune system is, low, is uh, lower, and, and he has a chance of being affected, especially if he moved around a, a particular area that has a lot of uh, COVID infections. Yes, that's the first thought. But you can even talk about the next stage of early detection uh, where a person already got infected and you can start seeing uh, digital signs of the infections. Uh, like he starts uh, doing less physical activity uh, because he is weaker. The person may, might not know yet that uh, he got infected, but he did. And, and those are signals that we can actually extract from the data from the smartwatches and from the questionnaires and use it to, for this early detection. So going back, yes, we have a very good model that is able to predict COVID with very high accuracy, uh, but that was just the start because uh, the study, again, co consider the fact that you have 5,000 people in Israel from all around Israel, from all age groups, besides children, we didn't uh, recruit children, and uh, you can see or you can monitor them for the entire period and many things happen. So, for example, Israel is not a boring country and many things indeed happen. And you had the lockdown and you had vaccinations. I'll go back to it in a second. And you had the war, uh, actually two wars during our study. And, and you have other aspects that you can monitor and see their effects on different subgroups, on different uh, individuals and see the, those effects. So if I go back to the vaccination example, many of our studies, without even uh, planning to do it, uh, focus on the safety of uh, COVID vaccines. And uh, our first study, or one of the first ones, uh, was with the, the third vaccination, third COVID vaccination, the first booster. And actually, when Israel decided to give that first booster, that retrospectively was a success, uh, at that time, uh, the, the clinical trials were very limited. A few dozens of people in the clinical trial. And it was very difficult uh, to, to, to understand the, the safety of the, the, of the booster. Of course, the first and second the vaccines were already proven. And uh, at the time, we found ourselves with over, I think, five, uh, 1,500 people participating in the study, uh, which actually reports, uh, in, in their reports, uh, report the same things that are reported in a clinical trial with vaccines. So we had a clinical trial for the safety of the third vaccine without even meaning to do it. And in addition to those self-reported uh, 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 questions, we also had physiological data from the smartwatches, like how the, the vaccine affects the heart rate, how this affects the heart rate variability, how it affects the uh, level of oxygen in the blood. So many interesting things that we could see and we actually were the, the largest uh, clinical trial with the, the, fir the third uh, vaccine at that time. Now, you said that uh, you're using your, your research also to predict behavior and to predict the way, um, you know, people react to, um, to health challenges and, and, and beyond. So can you give us an example from that particular study about one element that uh, we're able to predict? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So, for example, one of the studies we work on right now is on predicting happiness or mood level of people. So we can actually predict whether a person is going to be happy or sad in a certain day, one day in advance, uh, which is... Uh, you can think of different... Uh, uh, applications for that such an uh, uh, use case but just in in general that's quite crazy if i can use a physiological data to predict whether a person is, is going to be happy that's quite awesome and in general and, and what does uh, the body tell us before someone is is like for example in popular culture it is well known that friday mm -hmm. is a is a happy day everybody loves friday is it supported by your study that people 
begin to prepare for Friday or Thursday in terms of their body? You see it. You definitely see the difference between weekdays and weekends uh, in terms of happiness. You can see how sleep, which is not unsurprising, right? How sleep affects a, a, a mood and how physical activity affects mood. You can see it very clearly and supporting uh, previous uh, studies, uh, of course. So when people have a... A good night's sleep, they're happier. When people work out, they're happier. Definitely. Okay, that, yeah. these are two very important takeaways for, for our audience. I have to say, though, that from our study, we see just the correlation between those things, and it's clearly not something we should separate, the causation or causality. It doesn't mean that if you sleep more, if, if I ask a person yeah. to sleep more, it will be happier. Right. We cannot say it yet, maybe in future studies. But we can see that there is a direct connection between the quality of sleep and uh, mood. And in general, it just implies how, how predictable is human behavior, uh, much more than we expect. Now, let's um, spend a couple of minutes to discuss the, the role of the algorithm, right? So you, you talked about AI, machine learning, and all those things. If you can describe in simple terms for our audience, how does it work? when you take an unbelievably large amount of information and what kind of tools you need in order to accurately crop information out of it? Yeah. So uh, I'll start by saying that AI is a, a very wide a set of tools that are, us- that are in many terms are a used as, as one box, but it's a variety of tools that can be used very differently. I would say that the common uh, thing about AI is how to use data to get some insights in general. That's my interpretation. You can see other definitions. In our study, we use specific type of AI that is called supervised machine learning, and I'll ex- explain what it means. What we do is we take a lot of examples We actually try to uh, teach the machine uh, to get some insights from looking at examples. Some of the examples could be positive and some of them could be negative. So, for example, taking the COVID case, we can take days in which the person didn't have COVID and look at what was the different types of features, different types of data points, like uh, what was the level of sleep, what was the level of activity, what was the heart rate, and so on, on that day. And doing the same thing for days in which the person did have COVID. And once we collect many such examples, we can give it to an algorithm, to a classifier, that can actually go over this data and create different types of rules or probabilistic a, a, Uh, ideas of what uh, characterizes a negative examples and what char- characterizes positive examples. And there are many uh, such algorithms that can be used. I would say, though, that the main problem in our studies and in many other studies is not to actually use the algorithm over the examples, but is the, pre- the more preliminary stages of how to collect the data Collecting the data is a very tedious job. I can give a few examples from our study. And how to extract the features, those important data points, important data characteristics, or a job usually called as a feature engineering. I would say those are the main problematic tasks. Then throwing it to the algorithm and let it learn This is That's the easier. easier part. That's easier. Let me ask you one last question because we have to wrap up because our time is running out. Um, so what's the, looking forward, what's the next step of your, what's the next phase of your, of your research? So uh, I think that the idea we demonstrated here of the, the importance of uh, monitoring people over a long period of time Uh, for medical purposes and for non-medical purposes, uh, can give a, a lot of value. Uh, we demonstrated it for, for example, in the medical case for uh, COVID or respiratory infections. But we already now we are taking it inspired by those ideas. We just incorporated a new company 
that its main goal is to help a uh, migraineurs people that suffer from migraines and predict whether tomorrow they're going to have migraine or not and for such people such information is very important because they can actually for the first time uh, try to control their life being more prepared uh, doing things that are very relevant for them to solve those issues and this is just one more example and uh, looking at the world of medicine when you go to a PCP uh, to your uh, family doctor and the fact that the doctor only sees you for a second or a few minutes and ask you a few questions and he doesn't have the entire information of what happened until that point uh, makes the diagnosis a uh, very problematic and in many cases the doctor is wrong and by providing this information A much more rich set of information and the insight because the information itself won't be useful it will be just a large amount of information but providing this uh, uh, insights uh, can re- revo- revolutionize the the way we look Now, at medicine um, I have to ask you this question um, so what you're saying makes so much sense right there's so much information out there and we can use it to improve people's lives people's health and and You know in in so many ways now all those big companies out there Google and Apple and you you name it all the big companies that are collecting information about us um, I'm sure they know what you what you're saying is not new to them right uh, what is being done by all those tech giants to improve our lives and So you're right those companies are not standing aside and they are working hard on uh, achieving similar goals to the ones I described the world will go there with me or without me and with those companies or without them uh, so you can see recent examples of how Apple Watch can actually uh, give you neck again uh, ECG uh, results or it can alert you it's still you're... not hospital grade EKG you Right, but it's FDA approved. Yeah. So, a, so it's a good start. And it could give you different types of alerts uh, before uh, you're going to have a heart attack or similar things. Uh, so it's going to those directions. I think that the main focus of those companies are the, the biggest uh, or the most, I would say, unfortunately, popular diseases like a heart, heart condition that can be monitored very well from smart watches. But there are so many domain uh, domains and transferring the knowledge from one domain to another is still a very b- difficult prob- uh, task. So we are very good at specific tasks that we investigated and work hard on and doing them right. But doing the same thing for other domains is still a uh, difficult. So there are so many diseases, there are so many uh, 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 health conditions that we should take care of and I think there is a uh, A variety of things to do that is enough for everyone well wonderful this this has been really an eye-opening conversation I want to thank you professor Shmoeli for joining us today thank you again for having me and uh, to our audience um, I'd like to say goodbye until our next episode of Taiwan bound this is Taiwan bound the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University and Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.